This morning, let's turn our Bibles to the book of Philemon, or I could say that the text of Philemon, or the the letter of Philemon. Uh, We are working our way through the New Testament, and before we get to 2 Timothy, I thought we'd uh, look at Philemon. It is a prison epistle. In other words, Paul wrote this while he was still incarcerated. As we've been telling you, Paul wrote to first to Timothy and Titus when he was released, his first release from prison. We know that he would be rearrested, and then he would write to Second Timothy. So we'll look at that the next time we're together. But this morning, I wanted us to look at the book of Philemon. Philemon, it's right after Titus. It's a short chapter, but with a powerful, powerful message for us. I've entitled this message, Forgiveness and Reconciliation. I pray if God is working with you on that issues or those issues, that today you would leave different than the way you came, that you take care of business with the Lord. Because how do so much we need forgiveness and reconciliation? If you need a Bible, please raise your hand so you can read along with us. Just raise your hand and we'll lend you a Bible. Very well. Philemon chapter 1, or the only chapter, (laughs) verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. To the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Therefore, comma, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for the love's sake I rather appeal to you being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. And I'm sending him back, and you therefore receive him. That is my own heart, whom I have wished to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing that your good deed might not be, not might, may not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave and beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with you, writing with my own hand. And I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me For I just, I trust that through your prayers, I shall be granted to you. And we'll look at the ending in the sermon. Let's pray. So Father, we've read your word. We're honoring you, Lord, by just that, reading your precious word. We have worshiped you in song, God. We have fellowshiped, Lord God, amongst each other, saying hello, welcoming one another, God, in your precious name. And now your word, Lord. We ask that you would speak to us this morning, going beyond what I have studied and written. Lord, speak to us, as always, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you guys hearing like a sound? I'm not Moses. I'm not on a mountain or anything, but uh, I guess they'll, the guys will somehow fix that. Guys, as, th- no, as we know, this is a personal letter to a personal friend. And unlike the other two letters that we just uh, studied, 1 Timothy and, and Titus on ministry specifics, Paul in this letter was giving forth a personal request on behalf of a, 
another brother in Christ. You see, Philemon had a slave by the name of Onesimus who had robbed him and fled to Rome. There he became a convert through Paul who sent him back to Philemon with this letter. What we learn from this letter is very simple. You ready? Repentance brings about forgiveness and forgiveness is the requirement for reconciliation. Have you been wounded? Or have you wounded? And I hope this morning, as I said, we allow this letter to be personal to us. I really pray that God, Holy Spirit, if, you, if you're in those positions, that the Holy Spirit will be, be speaking to you as he has been speaking to me all week. To aid us through healing, to encourage us to repent, that it may bring about reconciliation. Philemon also speaks of all that Jesus has spoken of in the Gospels. Did you, did you see that as we read through it? Did you see love and grace and mercy and forgiveness and reconciliation? All those things that Jesus taught and not only taught but acted out and gave forth. We see this in this letter. We see this in the heart of the letter. We see this coming out of Paul's pen. It's a reminder of what God has done for us through his son Jesus and how we need to apply those same things to others. A bit of a background. While in Rome, chained to a Roman guard, as I said, to his first arrest, he was basically on an ankle monitor. Don't raise your hand if you were ever on an ankle monitor. You know, that's a way, uh, you know, the, the authorities can uh, track you and, and know that you're home and you have, a, you have some, you know, liberty to go out and do things, but you're being tracked and, and sometimes you have to call your PO and if you don't know what a PO is, God bless you and let them know where you're going. And it's in a sense, that's the way he was incarcerated the first time. He had a place where he could stay, but he was constantly chained to a guard. He was, we call it on house arrest. But Paul somehow encountered a man by the name of Onesimus and found out that he was a fugitive in the city of Rome. He, he ran away to Rome. He was a slave who robbed his master. And he took off and he went AWOL. We don't know how the paths of Onesimus and Paul cross. Was Onesimus, was, was he arrested for a, a, a minor infraction? How he, how he came into the presence of Paul? We don't know, but we know who does know? Anyone who, who Paul encountered will encounter Jesus. That is a fact. <laughs> Paul says, I, I have to preach the gospel. I, I, I cannot not preach the gospel. It's just in me. And so whoever encounters, encounters Paul will encounter Jesus. And what a blessing Paul was able to minister to Onesimus. And he became born again. Imagine that. No doubt sharing with Paul the things that he had done. And so Paul says, who was your master? Oh, a guy named Philemon. Oh, guess what? I know him. You mean Philemon of Colossae? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're like that. It's only God can do that, Right? So let's look again at this study. Let's, let's just go through it and I'll point out some things and I pray the Holy Spirit will speak to you through other things. Again, he, he brings his salutation, something that's very familiar to us as we've been studying the letters of Paul. Paul, a, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, faithful Timothy, always hanging out with Paul, learning from Paul. But I want you to notice that Paul never see, sees himself as a prisoner of Rome. He never felt that he was chained to Rome, but that Rome was chained to him. I like that attitude, man. Hey, Rome is chained to me. In other words, guys, Paul was content where the Lord had him. I am a prisoner, he says, of Christ Jesus. He'll say that twice in this one short letter. As a matter of fact, if you turn over to Acts chapter 23 and verse 11, it was there where Paul was in a time and a place of his life, no doubt, to 
wondering how he was going to be able to minister to Rome, how he was able to continue on in his ministry, being constantly harassed, berated and hated, and even rejected by some of the brethren who, who knew the past Saul, who persecuted the church. But it was in Acts 23, 11, it says in the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. So he had the more sure word that he was going to Rome. Did he know how he was going to Rome? Did he know all the, all the details? No, he did not know that. Did he know that he was going to have, have be sh- uh, shipwrecked? No, but he knew those were his orders. And that's where God wanted him. That's why he was so faithful as he was arrested, as he was put on the ship, as he was trying to protect the, the crew of the ship. And they didn't listen to him. They shipwrecked. And he didn't run away. Not even a viper could have kept him from, coming, from arriving in Rome. He was content. Are you content where God has you today? Or are you running from his calling where he wants you? Paul saw it as an opportunity to preach the gospel. Not only that, to preach the gospel, as I said, even to the guards that were assigned to him 24 hours. And as we know in Philippians 4 tells us in verse 22 that he was even able to preach to the household of Caesar. People were getting saved. But can I say that? Am I content today? Am I in the place where God wants me? And if I am, is my life making a difference for the Lord? Can I be like Paul and be content? He moves on to to address his friend, Philemon, notice he says, a beloved friend and a fellow laborer. That was his recipient. That's who he was writing to. This man who name, whose name means affectionate or one who is kind. And Paul is a, appeals to Philemon first, notice, as a friend, a beloved of the Lord, a fellow partaker of our Lord's love, a believer in Christ. Then notice a fellow laborer. And as we just studied Titus, we know that ministry is a work, a good work, amen? And we're all in the ministry. If you didn't know that, I just ordained all of you. They're all in the ministry. I can do that. I used to be part of that church. And it's a good work. But notice that he says, a fellow laborer. Now check this out also. To the beloved Aphia. Many believe that she was the wife of Philemon. And Archippus, our fellow soldier, they believe that that was his son. Either way, Paul greets them. And Paul greets the son or this man, Archippus, as a fellow soldier, which tells us also the ministry is a battle. Our walk in the Lord is a battle. We we battle with the enemy, Satan. We battle with the world out there. And we battle with this, the flesh. It's a battle. We don't look like much, right? Right? But we're here today on Sunday to look in each other's eyes, to greet one another and say, hey, guess what, man? What? We made it another week. I didn't even think I was going to make it through the night, man. We're here. Praise the Lord. Yeah, the ministry is a battle. But I love this too, if I may say, he says, and to the church in your what? In your house. Now, now yes, the, the church met in their house. They, they met on the first day of the week, which was Sunday, and they met in, in their house. But guys, are, can we say that of our houses? Is God glorified in our house? Is God worshiped in our house? Do we gather together in our home and see it also as a church? The city, as I said, is Colossae. You can find that out in Colossians 4, 9. The home is Philemon and Aphias, and the church met in their home. I love that. And the church, guys, is our resting place from the work and the refuge, and a refuge from the battle. It's a resting place from 
the work, as he said it, a fellow laborer, and a refuge from the battle as fellow soldiers in faith. We need to gather. We need to come together. We need to open the word. We need to worship the Lord. We need that because we got a week ahead of us, man. And, and some of you got a heavy week ahead of you. The prayer team will be up here after the service. You, you come for prayer. You, you seek prayer. Some of you have a heavy, heavy week. And you just need prayer. That's what the church is. It's our ref, refuge. It's our resting place. He goes on with what's well-known opening, a well-known blessing from Paul. Grace to you and, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But may I make one more point? In my, I'm like teaching three sermons, aren't I? But may I make one more point concerning the, the, the laborer, concerning the soldier, concerning the church more specifically, that he gives here a Greek and a Hebrew greeting. The Greek greeting is grace and the Hebrew greeting is peace, shalom. And, and that's what the church is made up of. It's made up of Greeks and Jews and Gentiles and all kinds of people, man. It's not just for one type of people. It's not for one sect of people. It's for all people. And I just saw this just yesterday. And I thought, wow, God, as you're talking about the church in his house, it is for both the Greek and the Hebrew the slave and the master, all people. It is to be open and all people are to be welcomed and all are to come in, hear the word of God, hear the gospel, and we pray that they leave saved or encouraged and built up and equipped as the purpose of the church, amen? But it speaks volumes in the way it's worded. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, guys, as I always like to say in his greetings, that you will never experience the peace of God until you have embraced the grace of God. Well, pastor, how do I do that? Very simply, by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're looking for peace this morning? You're not going to find it until you have a relationship with Christ. And then you'll have not only the peace with God, but the peace of God. You need that. Receive Jesus. Embrace his grace. Unmerited favor. You can't do it by any kind of work. As Jesus told those in the Gospels, what must we do to get saved? This is what you must do. Are you ready? Yes, believe upon me and you shall be saved. Amen. Moving on, as we will, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers. So there's another sub-sermon there. How's your prayer life? Do, Do you have a prayer list? Do you pray for others? Do you pray for yourself? Do you pray for your spouse? Do you pray for your marriage? Do you pray for your children? Do you pray for your enemies? So now you're going, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Philemon was on Paul's prayer list. I believe it was Chuck Smith that said, prayer is one of the greatest privileges God has given to man. You communicate with God. That's all prayer is. I, I don't want to belittle it, or, or, but it's a privilege where you get to speak to the creator of this universe, your heavenly father, in the name of Jesus. We are at our highest, aren't we? When we are at our lowest, and that is on our knees, on our knees, praying. And here Paul says, brother, I'm, uh, I am making mention of you always in my prayers. 
Then he wants to speak of his character, Philemon's character. Notice he says, it's neat, hearing of your love <clears throat> and faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus Christ, that's always first, the vertical. And then the horizontal, would you notice this, the vertical is Jesus Christ, and then toward all the saints. I've heard this. You've got a great reputation toward the saints. Two great qualities, two great characteristics, joy and thanksgiving, that his, his love and, and, and faith that brought joy and thanksgiving to others. The, the, the love that he had for the Lord, the love that he had for the saints, sharing of your faith, he says, I love that. The sharing of your faith may become affected by the acknowledgement, notice this, of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. He's very Christ-like. Now that word underline it, sharing, is a, is a known word that you know well. It's koinonia. And that word koinonia means all one of you. Fellowship. Yeah. So it's more than just enjoying one's company. Are you ready for this? It's sharing one's life. That's what koinonia is. Sharing one's life. It's, it's just, it's more than donuts and coffee. And I like that. Maybe too much. I'm trying to wear this to hide some things. But, uh, and I'm sore, man, because I went back on my PT program. But um, it, it's more than that. That's great. That's a great start. But it's really investing in people. Investing in their lives, not, not prodding, not, you know, but just investing in love. And then they know that at 3 a.m. they can call you. I said, man, I'm struggling, man. That preacher said it's a battle. You know what? It is a battle. But I need a battle buddy. I need a battle buddy, right? Go army, man. Can I, can I talk to you? Sharing life, guys. We got it. We got it. I can. I love this letter. Uh, I, I've taught it so many times at men's retreats, and I was just looking back at my notes, man, five, six, seven times. But we got to move on. He says, verse seven: For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. I mean, just great things to say about Philemon. Other, other believers are at ease around Philemon. He made himself available. He made himself accessible, I always say. They could go to him. They felt at ease. He had a great spiritual tree and, and, and great fruit was, was being produced from him. And the saints were able to, to go to him and partake of his fruit. Can that be said of us? Can that be said of me this morning? What are others reporting about us? Are we refreshing other saints? Saints. Are we encouraging others? Are we sending notes or or texts? Wives, are you putting little notes in your husband's lunchbox? And and husbands, are you leaving a flower or 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 some sweet thing for your wife to wake up to? I remember nine eleven and. Uh, I was watching Larry King. How many of you remember Larry King? Hey, Larry, this is Larry King from. And he'd always introduce this. He always interview this young lady who was uh, a beautiful woman. She was part of the news crew of of some sorts. And I wish I, I, this is just coming off my memory. Uh, and um, she was on the plane. It was supposed to fly to Los Angeles that crashed into the Pentagon. And they brought her husband on, who was also well known. And he, Larry was interviewing him, and, and he was saying that when she got up very early to catch this flight, she left him a note. And it was an endearing note, as she always would, because she would travel much being in that, that type of work. And she would always leave him a note on, the, on his pillow or on her pillow. And, and she did such that day. And, and no doubt he... Sh- he cherished that note because that would be the last one that 
she would write to him. Uh, so, you know, we, we just got to do that. We, we just got to encourage one another, man. You know, and by sending a note, sending a text, saying thank you, encouraging one another. Now, as we read this, guys, Paul is not flattering Philemon. He's not flattering him. And somebody said, oh, he's just buttering him up for the appeal. He's, no, he's not. He's, he's, he's strengthening him. He's, he's encouraging him. And pointing out what has been proved through, through his faith in the Lord. And, and again, what others have said, what, what he has heard. Um, however, <laughs> however, comma, Paul uh, will use this honorable character of Philemon as the foundation for the appeal. And that is to forgive and reconcile a prodigal slave who is now a saint. And here's the appeal. First, the appeal is from the heart. Verse 8 and 9, look at, therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, Paul could, with great confidence, base his appeal on the fact that he was an apostle, and he was. Uh, notice he says, uh, uh, I can be bold and, and, and uh, as such a one as Paul, the aged. He was, the, he was a, um, an elder. One who was personally ordained by the risen Lord himself. I mean, you talk about authority. You, you talk uh, uh, about, you, you want to see my papers my endorsement. But, but that's not the way he, he approached it. Though he says, you know, I could. I, I could command you. Yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. I rather appeal to you. And now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul did not appeal to the flesh. He appealed to the Holy Spirit. He, he, appear, he appealed to the, uh, the sameness of him and, and Philemon uh, uh, in Christ uh, to saints, to, to believers. He, that's the way he'll, he'll appeal. He chose his words wisely as the Spirit led him, and, and he knew that Philemon would act, act upon what is right. I'm going to appeal to the heart to both our hearts who was touched by Jesus Christ, both our hearts that was saved. I want to appeal to you as a brother in Christ. You know, we understand the English proverb, you can't catch, you can catch more flies with honey than, than vinegar. But we're not dealing with flies. We're dealing with a saint. We're dealing with a soul we're dealing with a fellow believer in the Lord. And when we appeal or request, we should do this with love and respect rather than command and control. That's something we got to learn. Love and respect rather than command and control. And when you even can use and have to use command and control, you can approach it in love and respect as well. I get it. Some of you in positions at work, or you are in command and in control, but you can do it a little bit with some love and respect. Anyway, moving on. So what's his appeal? Look at, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. Now you just gotta think this, put yourself in the shoes of Philemon. You had a slave, no doubt he was treated well. It was just the times they lived, that's the way it was. There were masters and slaves. Yet a slave that was treated very well No doubt, because we know the character of Onesimus, excuse me, of Philemon, who ripped you off, who stole from you, and then took off. Now, when he reads this, guys, as as he's reading this letter, or or as the, the, the mailman who brings it is reading it, as it's read in the church, he hears that name, Onesimus, and it just, you know, perhaps it just 
the, the anger comes back. Perhaps emotions are, are brought in. You know, Onesimus. I know some of you have a name that, that may turn your stomach, that may upset you. He says, I appeal to you for, notice my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. Again, guys, uh, the coincidence of this runaway slave bumping into Paul under house arrest while chained to a guard in order to hear the gospel and accept Jesus as Lord is amazing. But notice he says, whom I have begotten while in my chains. In other words, Paul is the man who shared the gospel with this runaway slave. Just to think about that, how that was all laid out. There's another proverb, a Jewish proverb that says, coincidence is not a kosher word. You've heard me say that before. I, I like that. I, I, I hold to that about, as well. It's all about God's timely preparation. But don't get me wrong. God will never speak to one to steal and to rob. God will never speak to one who would to, be, to take off and, and leave. But you're dealing here with a, a prior sinner in a sense. Uh, one who wasn't saved, one who worked for Philemon and, and did this on his own. But God met him on the run and he got saved. And again, it's all about God's timely preparation. And notice he says, yeah, I'm talking about Onesimus. I'm talking about my son in Onesimus. I'm talking about the one who got saved through me preaching the gospel, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. Onesimus here, his name means profitable or useful. And no doubt, Paul and many scholars believe that he was having a play on the Greek word uh, of his name. The, the, the thief and the fugitive slave was transformed and is now living up to his name, profitable. I'm sending him back, he says. 900 miles as the crow flies. Back to Colossae from Rome. You therefore receive him. That's his appeal. That is my own heart. Whom I wish to keep with me that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. Paul says, receive him as my own heart. I was thinking about those Marines and the soldier and that sailor that were killed in Afghanistan. And, and, and hearing the parents talk, that, that was my heart. That was my daughter. That was, those were my sons. I trusted you and their life. And it's, it's just as like that, Paul saying, he is my heart. You need to receive him as you receive me. These, these poor parents, we need to keep praying for them. You know, that just shouldn't have happened, the bravery of those men and women. But he said, you receive them as, as my own heart. Paul, Paul knew the law. Roman law stated that if a slave ran away from his master, it would be a crime to hide or to use the slave for personal use. But he held on to him for a bit because he needed to, some discipleship. He, Paul needed to, in a sense, you know, walk him, walk him through his faith and, and give him some basic training before he would send him. And, and, and he's asking Philemon. He's appealing to him, appealing to his spirit, appeal, appealing to him and to restore him back and, and, and to keep him because who I'm sending you back isn't the man who ripped you off anymore. I'm sending you back a born again, changed man who's under a greater master, the same master that we serve, God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I know this man has done wrong and I know he has wronged you, Philemon, and I know that he dares deserves to be punished and many were, 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 were put to death because of what, what he has done. 
but consider him as you would my own heart and be merciful to him. And without your consent, but without your consent, he says, I wanted to do nothing that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. I love that. Nothing should be, in a sense, commanded by arm twisting, by force. Again, he had the authority to, to do that. He, he could say, you take him. This is, this is what you're going to do. But what would that do? That would just instill more hurt and pain and, and anger in Philemon. No, he says, look, it, I, I'm not going to do it by compulsion, by arm twisting. I just want to do it to, through the spirit of God. And, and really, through the spirit of God, that's the only force that should be used. If we want to use force, let us go before God and, and pray for one who has wounded us. That, that, that the Holy Spirit would speak to them, would deal with them, would save them if they're not saved. But the only force that I must even confront one who wounded me or you who have wounded one to go back and to ask the only power, the only thrust, the only force that should be used is that of the Holy Spirit. And I know it's difficult because what do we struggle with? This, this skin suit. And I like this. Look at 15. Oh, I love this. You, those of you that I'm praying for, your sons and daughters who are prodigals, I always look at this verse. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose that you might receive him forever. Think about that. Perhaps. Perhaps your daughter departed. Perhaps your son departed, became a prodigal. For a while, for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. Paul brings about the providence of God, how the Lord orchestrated this escape into Rome and to save Onesimus. Paul is suggesting that God used this wrong to make a right. Like the parable of the prodigal son found in Luke 15, Onesimus had had, had to leave in order to be found. He had to come to the end of himself. In other words, trusting in himself in order to trust in the one who loved him the most. And as he said in that, in that proverb in Luke 15, God, I have sinned against you and my father. Again, vertical and horizontal. He had it right. And Onesimus came, or yeah, Onesimus came to that point that he knew that he had sinned against his father. He needed salvation, and then he knew he needed to make it right with his master. He's come to the end of himself, and we're praying for your sons and daughters, those names I have, that I'm praying that they will come to the end of themselves, that they will get tired of eating from the pig's sty, from the slop of this world, and realize they have sinned against their father, their heavenly father, and against you. If you haven't given me your sons and daughters' names, give them to me after this service. I promise weekly I will pray for them by name. I have some experience. He says, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave. A beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. He's profitable to you. As he comes back, he will be employed by you, yes, of the flesh, but also he will stand beside you in your home on the first day of the week, worshiping God right along with you. Think about that. Master and slave, yes, Greek and Jew, Gentile, all together in the house of Philemon, worshiping the Lord. And yes, even now Onesimus, if you forgive him, you reconcile your relationship 
with him. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. He says in 17, if then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. Put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. Here's my IOU. Here's my promissory note. Here's what I'm saying. I'm taking the pen from the one who's, who's dic- you know, writing this down for me as I dictate it. No, now I'm taking the pen and I'm telling you right now, I will repay. And then just like a good old Jewish guy, no, not to mention that you, well, that you owe me even your own self besides. I preach the gospel to you, Philemon. I came to Colossae to plant a church. I preached in the streets. I preached in the synagogues. And you came to faith. Just mention it. (laughs) I love that. Just imagine receiving a letter from the apostle who has turned the world upside down, or as we would say, right side up. The busiest, most wanted, most desired man of God at that time. Imagine receiving a letter from the one who is responsible for preaching the gospel to a crowd in Colossae of which you were part and were saved. Paul is asking Philemon to forgive him, to restore him, and to place any debt he incurred on his bill. He says, I will repay you in full. What does that sound like, friends? It sounds much of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, put it on my account. I died for them. I bled for them. Receive them, Father, on my account. Speaks so much of what the Lord has done. It speaks of what is known as the doctrine of imputation. What's that? Well, John Corson says this. Imputation is based upon justification, which can only come about through propitiation. Well, gee, thanks, John. And propitiation means that the righteous wrath God shall hurl on me, the righteous anger he should feel toward you, he says, was absorbed by his son. That's what he's talking about here. Jesus on the cross made various statements, seven to be, uh, seven great statements, and one of them was to tell us die. You know what that means? It is finished. Not I am finished. Amen? Praise God for that. He didn't say I'm finished. And then, no. It is finished, the most powerful single word of all of Jesus' ministry because he used an accounting term, meaning that the debt has been paid in full, that justice has been satisfied, that Jesus paid the full payment. And Paul is saying the same thing to Philemon, who knows about this doctrine of imputation, who knows about this Accounting word. He says, yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord by doing just that. In concluding remarks, he says, I have confidence in your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. What could that even more be? Could it be full emancipation for the For an Onesimus, we don't know. But meanwhile, also, (laughs) he says, I'm going to come stay with you if the Lord wills. I trust that through your prayers, and I hope you're praying, he says, that it will be granted to me. Uh, Nothing like having your father in the faith coming to stay at your house. I'm going to come check up on you guys. No, he, he wants to come and, and be 
also be involved with this reconciliation, this, this reunion of, 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 of love and grace and mercy. Uh, he, he, he wants to be part of that. And then he closes, guys, again, a very similar uh, closing that we've noticed here. Uh, look at verse 23. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus greets you, as do Mark, uh, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, which is the author of Acts and the gospel uh, uh, named after his own name, the gospel of Luke, my fellow laborers. Uh, it says, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, amen. But I want you to see one name in that grouping, the name of Mark. Now, Mark is the author of the gospel. But friends, let me just end this way. Paul mentions Mark, which tells me Paul was not only speaking of what God expects of Philemon to do regarding forgiveness and reconciliation. He's just not speaking truth, and it's truth, and he's not sharing what God would want to see as well. And No, you see, guys, Paul is speaking from his own experience. Because Paul learned that he needed to restore Mark back into fellowship. What are you talking about? Well, remember in his first missionary journey, Mark abandoned Paul and Barnabas. Uh, he left them. Um, Paul or, knew that Mark was his Onesimus. That he deserted the team. And Paul wanted nothing to do with him. As a matter of fact, it got so sharp that even him and Barnabas separated. Paul says, Mark cannot be trusted. Mark is not committed. But 12 years later, after Mark's desertion, Paul was willing to forgive and restore Paul was willing, willing to write off any debt that Mark incurred in the past. Paul would say in other letters that he's useful to me. He's, he's my brother. See, Paul's speaking from experience, from a heart that was wounded, from a, from a partner that was burned, from someone who took off on him and and, and then the work became more for the rest who were there. Guys, forgiveness plays a key role in the life of the saint. Forgiveness keeps our hearts free from the disease of resentment. It helps us to forgive. A Puritan, Thomas Watson, wrote many years ago, he said this, we need not climb up into heaven to see whether our sins are forgiven. Let us look into our hearts and see if we can forgive others. If we can, we need not doubt that God has forgiven us. Who am I speaking to? How many of you are harboring bitterness? Hatefulness. I know those scars. I, I know those wounds are, are deep. We've all been hurt. But perhaps God is speaking to you this morning in this. I close with this as the team comes up. Never are we more like God when we forgive. Never are we more like Jesus when we become a peacemaker in order to restore a relationship. May we, like Onesimus, celebrate the freedom of our salvation. May we, like Philemon, forgive not to hold debt over others, but... Do our best to impute that anger and pain to our Lord's account. And as we said, may we, like Paul, be a peacemaker. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for this time that you've given to us to look through this letter. Lord, if we've wounded anybody, God, forgive us. If we're able to go and ask for forgiveness, God, if, if, that's, if, that's a, if we're able to do that, if, if it's in our power to do that, if, 
If we can do that, God, then we need the Holy Spirit more than any time. But if we've been wounded, God, let us first take that pain to you, Lord. And let us prepare ourselves and pray for those who have wounded us that perhaps you will move their heart to come to us and ask for forgiveness. May we be ready for that, God. You know us, Lord. You know every one of us. We ask for your healing. As we sang that song, we ask for your precious healing in all the areas in our life, God. We leave here different now, God. We leave here accountable to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.